Uh, in the past decades, we've seen an um, increase in so-called populist supply across the world. Uh, the sheer number of populist parties, leaders, movements, etc., has taken an unprecedented uh, proportion in today's world. Uh, this not only has uh, implications in Europe and Latin America, but we also see this in other countries that are perhaps less studied, like Thailand, Australia, the Philippines, etc. With that in mind, uh, it has never been more important to have an accurate and comprehensive understanding of which actors can and should actually be considered uh, populist. The identification and measurement of the populist supply is vital for that to occur. As of recent, several research efforts have set out to do exactly that. And in that regard, I'm having a conversation today with Maurits Meyers, um, together with his colleague, Andre Zaslove. He has created a data set measuring populism within parties through the usage of uh, expert surveys. Maurits, uh, I give you the, the floor to kind of present the data collection effort that you have gone through. All right, well, thank you, Steven. Uh, very nice uh, to be here uh, uh, digitally. Uh, thanks for the invitation, very nice. Uh, hello, students, of course. Uh, so my name is Maurits Meyers. I work at the Radboud University in the Netherlands. Um, and, um, well, some shameless promotion. First, if you want to follow me on Twitter or check my website, these are the details. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about our expert survey. And I'll start with what expert surveys can do and perhaps cannot do um, in, in general, right? Because expert surveys have been uh, criticized somewhat um, because some people say, well, you know, you, what you do with an expert, expert survey essentially is that you uh, ask a lot of experts, in this case, political scientists, to rate parties on a number of uh, scales. And so the first expert survey was, was done in, in, the, in the 80s, and they sent out these paper forms to political scientists around Europe to ask them, where would you place each party? And then you have a scale and they had to write the name of the party on, on, the, on the piece of paper and that's how they collected it. Well, these days we do it a little differently. We still work on scales, but we don't just ask for the left right question, uh, the left right dimension. We ask all sorts of dimensions and in our case, populism. But some people say, well, you know, putting just parties on a scale really oversimplifies something that's actually very, very complicated. We had one criticism from a French scholar who said, well, you cannot really ask me to place the, 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 the National Front, so the Front National, French party, uh, radical right party on a scale, because I've done tons and tons of qualitative research and interviews, but still I don't feel comfortable putting, placing that party. So on the one hand, it is, it is people say, well, it's an oversimplification. Another, some other people also say, well, it's really unclear what you measure, right? So what do you measure when you, when you ask experts to rate a party? Is it their manifesto? Is it what they say in public? Um, or are, are they perceptions? And another question is, well, what do you actually measure? Do you measure the party at large with all the party activists as well? Or is it the leadership? Um, and so what we argue and why we think our approach, uh, the approach of an expert survey is, is suitable for measuring party positions, um, uh, not just on populism, but also for other, for the other issues is that, well, it is a specific measure and uh, that has its strengths, but also its weaknesses perhaps, but the strength are it's a reputational measure. So it's what, where do the parties stand in the reputation of these experts? Um, so in that sense, um, it, it, it is able to not only look at what parties say in manifestos, but also what they say in public and experts kind of synthesize that information uh, when they rate their parties. Um, also, expert surveys do not really replace in-depth in, in case studies. It's something different, right? It is complementary. And sometimes if you want to compare across countries or across time, uh, across parties, you need to have some kind of standardized way of comparing and placing parties. So in-depth case studies are great and, and I love them and I love to read them, but 
if you want to create a data set or to, for quantitative analysis, you, you have to kind of uh, make a measure that is standard, you can standardize across, across parties. Um, so we, we basically, we argue, uh, if, if you give the experts the right instructions to where they should focus on what part of the, what kind of part of the party um, and how, what kind of information they should take into account, they, they are a really good way to measure uh, party policy and also party populism. Um, okay, so why did we start this project? So basically we saw, well, we see all this research on populism, also as Steven just said, uh, but we didn't really have a, a clear measure of, of parties' populism. Um, on the demand side, so for voters, um, I understand you also have a video about with my colleague Andrei Zaslav, who did a, uh, a a voter measure populist attitudes among voters. We have very good measures of of populism, but we didn't really have that on the on the party level. Um, so uh, one reason is that people often think of populist parties as being either populist or not. So either you are a populist party or you're not a populist party, the dichotomous question. But we actually think this is not really accurate. Some parties are more populist than others, and some parties also could become more populist than, uh, than before. So we think, we often say, we also often talk about uh, populism as a degree in, in our usual day-to-day uh, -day conversations about politics. Oh, that politician is really populist, right? As this really populist claims uh, he or she is making. And I think that really suggests that people often think of it in, in, as, as a continuous variable. Also, if you use it as a continuous variable, you, um, you can really um, delve into the differences between parties' populism. Um, yeah. Another thing what we say is important when measuring populism is that parties, uh, populism basically is not just a one dimensional construct. So populism has different components in theory and those should also be measured separately, we, we believe. And that also allows you to, if you, do, if you measure them separately, you, you measure populism as a, as a latent construct. So something that you cannot directly observe but that is there if you if you measure the kind of the underlying components. Um, so that's basically what we're uh, what we did. So we uh, used this expert survey to measure the components of, of populism for all parties in in European party systems, making a, a, a in interval variable, so a continuous variable running from zero to ten. Um, the expert survey kind of conveys a consensus among experts where the party is placed on populism, but also on other characteristics such as left-right position or immigration position, et cetera. And um, well, if, you, if, if you've read the paper, the comparative political studies paper, you also see that we did a lot of uh, extra studies and analyses to ensure that it has strong internal validity, is reliable and um, is not biased, for instance, among, uh, among uh, experts. Okay, so um, yeah, another point perhaps that's interesting to highlight is what's really an advantage of expert service is that it's a quite a, a, a let's say, uh, cost-friendly way of measuring, of, of, of collecting data. Um, sometimes if we, if you, uh, people use textual analysis, so they code party manifestos, for instance, and that is, um, that is great and it can be a very useful um, data source, but you need manual coders, you need people, students, you employ, you pay them hourly wages, of course, and uh, it's, it's an enormous organizational hassle to, to code um, parties in, in, in their respective languages. Um, so it's really a extremely big operation. And expert surveys are in that sense a much kind of smaller, uh, small, small scale project and, and they're much cheaper because basically what we're doing is we're creating a public resource together. So we ask, ask experts to fill out this survey. They don't get paid, but, but they get the data in return. And that's basically um, how that works. And I think that's really a nice way of collaboration as well. 
Okay. Did I miss something, Stephen? If, if, if so, just please interject. I will, I will. Right now, everything is uh, perfectly clear, so I can Great. go ahead. Okay, cool. So we did this uh, expert survey uh, two years ago already um, in the spring of 2018. We, uh, in the end, we have 28 European countries, um, including the UK, which we also consider to be a European country, of course. Um, we contacted about 860 experts and we had an, uh, so over one third responded and filled in the survey. Uh, and those experts um, uh, rated, so these 257, uh, I think in the end, uh, we, we had 250 political parties. Um, and they uh, basically rated parties on, on 16 items. And um, I'm not going into detail for all the items, but you can kind of see here on this slide that populism uh, is measured with five items, which really is kind of in line with the theory. I mean, Steven, did they students know about populism before? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. So you, I don't have to explain all the all the different no. elements, but you have read the Müller definitions. Uh, I'm sure, and, and we really follow that ideational approach, right? This idea that populism is, a, is an idea or maybe even an ideology and that, and that is expressed in these different elements. We uh, split it up in five elements um, where we have uh, an, an anti-elitist view and people-centric view, a Manichean worldview, so basically that you see as a politics is a struggle between uh, good and evil, good and bad. And then we have this idea that the people are homogenous and that they share one will. And we often, those two things are taken together, but we actually think they are something separate. So one thing is that the people are homogenous that says something about the unity of their, of the community. So the unity of the people and the general will is something unity about their preferences and those we contend are different things. Um, yeah. Can you so maybe say a little, a little something about why you also measured the, the style in the organization? Oh yeah, sure. So, um, okay. So besides the other policy issues that we also measure, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, left, right, immigration, EU integration, nativism, Etc. We also measure political style and party organization. And I think it is not so clear from the final paper, but initially we were also interested a little bit in, well, you have these different definitions of populism. So you have a ideological definition, you have the stylistic definition and a kind of a more organizational uh, definition. And we wanted to see whether that really mattered and whether kind of these definitions provided different uh, kind of you had different parties that came out of the definition and well in the paper in the end we don't really analyze it as such but um, you could do that for instance if you, in your in your master's thesis or your bachelor's thesis uh, and use our data to, 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 to check that so we have these political style questions that kind of are related to definitions of populism as a style so portraying that politics is, is, is simple, uh, emotional appeals, and then of course also perhaps in combination with people-centric and anti-elitist uh, claims, right? So you can combine those items and you can, and that's I think also kind of the, the beauty, if you will, of, of this kind of data. You can use, use it the way you want and create your own scale, right? You can also use the data to create your scale of what you think is, is a populist radical right ideology, right? Mm -hmm. um, and party organization is, is similar, right? So uh, they say populist organization is really this idea that it's a top-down organization and there's no intra-party intra democracy and we tried to capture that. Mm -hmm. But in the end, we the, we didn't focus on that so much in the paper, but maybe in the future paper or maybe uh, someone else in the political science community, right? So it's a public resource, everybody can, can use the data and, um, and uh, yeah, and, and do that. Okay, so 
we, so we measured populism with five items, and then we used uh, some, some uh, well, let's say statistical tools to kind of check whether these items are actually representative of one thing, single thing. And we did a couple of things here, but uh, as you could also read in the paper, but perhaps uh, the simplest way of explaining this is that we did a exploratory factor analysis where we look at do they load on one dimension. And um, uh, what these results show is that they clearly do load on one dimension and also that these items are have relatively high uniqueness. That means that they are all quite important to measure the underlying latent construct. And we call that latent construct populism. No? So, um, which does suggest that you can measure populism with an expert survey using these items, right? Another thing where, you, where I think it's sometimes good to, to have a, let's say, a critical view on what expert surveys can and, and uh, or what their strengths are and what their weaknesses could be is, is you can look at the standard deviations of these different items. Here on this slide, I compare, so the, the PAPA data, which is our data with the Chapel Hill expert survey, from 2014, which is kind of the biggest expert survey uh, out there. At least it's been repeated many, many times. It's been very, very successful. And um, the standard deviations is basically per, so we look at per item, what is the, how much do um, experts kind of disagree on where to place a party? So the bigger the standard deviation, uh, the bigger the disagreement. And you could argue that, well, on the one hand, there could be disagreement between experts. It's not a problem because, well, that's also why you want to do an expert survey and why it's perhaps better than just um, asking the opinion of one scholar or reading one qualitative uh, case study uh, because you want multiple opinions. But on the other hand, you could also say, well, if people, experts really disagree, then maybe it's harder to answer the question or it's un the, the concept. In, in the worst case scenario, the, the concept is, is unclear. Now, um, what we see here is that I think generally good news. So generally, uh, agreement is 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 quite high. Uh, however, we do see that kind of these easier items, so easier to measure items like left-right position, are get lower standard deviations than slightly more complex items like the are the people homogenous or not, which this indivisible people. Uh, item here uh, conveys. So that is, I think, important to realize that if you do an expert survey, questions can be hard. And the harder the questions are, the bigger standard deviation, this deviation among uh, experts can be. On the other hand, you also see that often used resources in political science, like the EU salience and the EU dissent variable in the Chapel Hill expert survey, really get very similar. Uh, standard deviation. So I'm not too worried, uh, but perhaps we as a community should think a little bit about, okay, well, what are our benchmarks? Are there benchmarks here? Um, yeah. Okay, well, let me also show you a little bit the where you can find the data and you can also play with the data a little bit. So we have a, a website, which is papadata.eu. And uh, you can read a little bit about the, the data on the website, but we we'll have two tabs here that are, might be interesting. The data tab is uh, where you can download the data or you get a link to the data. And the interactive data app brings you to a uh, kind of an online app. And you can use that to, to create your own plot. So for instance, now we, see here a plot of parties level of populism and their left right position and what you nicely see here is this kind of u-shaped form that we see on the left we see on the far left high levels of populism as well as on the far right and if you go over with your mouse you can see which parties these are so c x a is for instance the 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 greek golden dawn party um, the PVV is the Dutch Radical Right Freedom Party. 
but you can also uh, uh, add the labels and maybe choose a different country. So let's say, let's look at the UK and say, okay, well, UKIP is here, generally quite right wing and, and rather populist. Uh, the Conservative Party is not really considered populist. This is under Theresa May's tenure. So maybe now experts would rate the party differently. That just is to again be, just to be clear for everybody's understanding. So the X axis is left right ideology and the Y axis is populism, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. correct. So, uh, so this is left right ideology and this is the populism uh, mm -hmm. variable. And um, yeah, exactly. So, but you can also, and that's, uh, that's interesting. So he's okay, well, populism is, is nice, but maybe I'm also interested in um, parties, uh, EU positions, right? And then here, the bottom is your anti-EU here, your pro-EU. Then we see that in the UK party system, UKIP is down here with a score of 0 0.18, which is very low. And the conservatives are as, most of you know, of course, also uh, strongly you're a skeptic. Um, and um, the Green Party is the most pro-EU party in, in the UK, at least the ones that measured here. Oh, here's another one in yellow, hard to see, it's the Liberal Democrats, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, and you can add some other countries, Ireland, for instance, you can choose different variables you're interested in um on both axes and it's quite fun to play you can also download these uh um these here if you click the i think the photo button you can download the plots and maybe if you want to write a paper you can you can use that um and the good thing is that you don't need to do kind of complicated uh uh, graphing in a statistical package to to use that data. So I think that's quite nice, especially for students. And well, I, I hope you use it. And if you do, um, always happy to see uh, the output, of course. Um, do we want to talk a little bit more about this? Uh, um, I, I think we covered pretty much all the, the basis, perhaps to kind of wrap up and give us kind of a, yeah. let's call it a, your summary argument, right? What's the what are what are what can we do with this data? What are the implications of it? Like, how can the scholarly field and the discipline take advantage of it? What are the the real yeah the 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 benefits of of using this? Yeah, yeah. So, what I think the the, the takeaway point is basically that we uh, uh, we show um, in the article right that populism can be measured using an expert survey. What we also show is that conceptualization is very, very important. Mm -hmm. So um, we contrast, for instance, um, the anti-elite salience item that the Chapel Hill expert survey uh, uh, kind of measured. And that, that is also often used as a proxy for populism. And we show that, and so this anti-elite salience is something different than, than populism. And we really show that conceptualization and thinking closely about how can I translate a co complex multi-component concept into, um, in, into kind of uh, items, survey items that you, that you can ask experts and measure. That's really important. It also suggests that we can use, kind of if you have complex definitions, we can really test whether they work. Right. Sometimes we have multi-component definitions of all sorts of things. And if you ask them as separate components, you can look empirically, hey, do they load on one dimension? So sometimes things can sound very great in theory. And it could also have been the case that we didn't find that these items were actually measuring populism or that only two of them did. And that would have been interesting, an interesting result in itself. Right. So I think that's an important part of it if you have definitions and uh, especially if there are multiple components, actually you should use empirical research to, to, to actually validate whether they, they are really one, one uh, kind of one construct, one concept. Um, 
And I think, well, what, what the field can, can do with this data is, but you can use this data in all sorts of ways, right? So you can use um, it to measure how the degree of populism between countries. Um, you can also see, well, does do kind of conditions in the political party or in a country affect the level of populism of the parties in a country? You can also use it to combine it with survey data and look at, well, what type of voters vote for uh, what kind of populist parties. And perhaps one, the, one of the most important things that can be, um, actually, it's not the slide I want, wanted to show, why I think measuring populism as a continuous variable is especially important is what we kind of call the borderline cases, right? So I talked before about the fact that some scholars say, well, populism is a kind of a dichotomous concept. It's either you're populist or not. Um, but there are actually quite a lot of parties that are, are kind of in the middle. And you see that in the Netherlands, the Socialist Party, kind of this left, far left party, they score around a six. And in some qualitative overviews, they are called populist and, and others they're not. And that kind of, if you only have that information, kind of leaves you, especially a student, but also like, okay, well, what are they then? Are they populist or not? And well, our data shows, well, yeah, they're kind of, they're, they're exactly that, they're in the middle. They're in a, a borderline case. And the same goes for the German Linke. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a very important, uh, important element. So yeah, to wrap up, I think the, 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 the expert survey was a, was a great success. Um, and um, it shows that also with perhaps a little, you just have to kind of an, to have to have an inter entrepreneurial spirit. So like, oh, just try this, let's do this and see uh, what comes out. And, uh, and I think that's, that's very nice and rewarding that it works. Um, and, and it shows the strength of the political science community that so many people want to fill this in and create a data source that we can all use. So, um, yeah, I think that's been a very great experience for me and uh, I hope you found it interesting. All right, Marit, thank you very much for giving us some insights in this very rich and may I add publicly available uh, data set. Thank you. Thank you, all right.